if you think, what is the biggest problem that most people have in their lives at the moment, apart from their kind of individual personal problems? It's the bloody government. I mean, it is a major problem. It's running a crap health system. The state schools are rubbish compared with what they could be. Um, they tax the bejesus out of us all. And you know, they're not very good at foreign policy. No. Uh, well, what are they doing well? Across the English-speaking world, the political right is abandoning freedom. The era of free market conservatism defined by the likes of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, William F. Buckley and Keith Joseph is being replaced by an illiberal force known as national conservatism. Welcome to Moral Sentiments, a show by the Institute of Economic Affairs seeking to find the common ground between classical liberalism and social justice. My name is Harrison Griffiths and I'm a communications officer here at the IAA. Thank you for joining me. Since the end of the Second World War, the free market movement and the movement for individual liberty have become synonymous with the political right. It's not difficult to understand why. Most of the prominent and successful champions of freedom in the political and academic sphere have been part of centre-right movements and political parties like the Conservatives here in the UK, the Republicans in the US and the Nationals in New Zealand. But as we discussed on episode one of Moral Sentiments, unity between free marketers and conservatives has always existed on a tense foundation. For most of post-Enlightenment history, conservatism and liberalism have been diametrically opposed. The decades between World War II and the 2008 financial crash are the exception, not the rule. Although liberals mostly differ with socialists and social democrats on how to get there, both groups share in common a desire for progress, dynamism and emancipation. The conservative right has traditionally been the force opposing those goals. The divisions are becoming clearer once again. Donald Trump's rise to the top of the Republican Party in 2016 signaled a shift away from the Reaganite coalition that held the party together since the early 1980s. While Trump did cut some taxes and red tape, he favoured import tariffs, high spending and tighter restrictions on immigration. He also favoured maintaining social security and agricultural subsidies, while his failed attempt to repeal Obamacare demonstrated that his main concern was not pro-market healthcare reform, but getting his predecessor's signature policy repealed. Without strong support for free markets, Trump's Republican presidency was defined by right-wing culture warring and chilling disrespect for constitutional checks on executive power. These have become the dividing lines between much of the American right and those who support liberal ideas and institutions. Since then, much of the right's intellectual energy has been devoted to creating a framework which solidifies Trumpism without Trump. Prominent conservatives like Republican Senators Josh Hawley of Missouri and J.D. Vance of Ohio as well as authors like Patrick Deneen and Saurabh Amari, have explicitly rejected key pe pillars of American liberalism, like trade, free markets, and religious freedom, as part of their national conservative ideology. Even the judiciary, the American right's most important institutional stronghold, is now under attack by conservative scholars like Harvard professor Adrian Vermeule, who favors a form of extreme conservative judicial activism under the seemingly benign label of common good constitutionalism. In the UK, the biggest threat to liberal values and institutions for now is conservative moderates who do little more than slow the onward march of left-wing ideas. But concerningly, the national conservative ideology is gaining a foothold. A conference attended by a series of conservative MPs, media personalities and intellectuals took place this year in the UK. While it's important to note that a wide variety of opinions were expressed, including some sympathetic to free markets, many of the key ideas put forward at the conference reflected the proudly illiberal, reactionary and nationalistic path the right seems to be slowly taking. Free markets, international trade and individual rights were all attacked by spokespeople. Even contraception, same-sex marriage and divorce were condemned by a few as examples of British society becoming too liberal. Thankfully, this ideology is yet to take a firm foothold on the British right. Unlike the US, our lack of religious identity and social conservatism make many of these ideas unpopular. But we shouldn't be so certain about some form of national conservatism taking hold over here. In the US, Trump shifted the Republican coalition, orienting them towards populist, conservative and economically left-wing white working class voters. Trump perfectly seized on the themes of communities being left behind by globalisation, trade and immigration. It was those voters who powered the populist and anti-free market agenda the Republican Party are pursuing. But they are less religious than the average American. Church attendance has been declining in those communities for decades, and they are hostile to religious conservatives on issues like abortion. 
Many of those same themes drove working class communities in the UK to support Brexit, oppose globalisation and ultimately move away from the left politically towards a newly populist collectivist political right. However you look at it, the right's attitude to individual liberty and free markets is becoming more hostile. Joining me today to discuss this concerning trend is the IA Senior Research Fellow, Jamie White. Last year, Jamie authored Taking Liberties, a paper critiquing the growing post-liberal ideology that underpins national conservatism. We will discuss what post-liberalism and national conservative are, why they're on the rise, and why it is vital for liberals to voice their opposition to it. So Jamie, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, just to start off with, talk a little bit about what post-liberalism is and how it underpins this sort of growing authoritarianism, national conservatism on the right. Well, post-liberalism initially is really a critique of liberalism. Uh, and by liberalism, they mean both the what we would call classical liberalism now and so the 19th century British version of liberalism, the kind of thing that I think you and I agree on. Um, and then liberalism in the modern American sense, meaning progressivism or you know, typical left wing. Hillary Clinton would be a good example of a liberal in that sense. And an interesting thesis of the post liberals is that these are really two sides, that they're really the same phenomenon. That modern progressivism is a natural outgrowth of classical liberalism, and the problem, they have the same problems, and they're responsible for everything that's wrong with modern Western society. So it, it begins as a critique along those lines. What it positively is, I mean, what post-liberals actually want by way of policy is not nearly as clear. And in fact, there was a recent book that came out called Regime Change Towards a Post-Liberal Future by a leading post-liberal intellectual, uh, Patrick Deneen, who is at the, he's at Notre Dame. Um, and it's incredibly thin on, on really concrete proposals for how to, how to have this, what this post-liberal regime would be. Absolutely. And that sort of plays into the very reactionary element of this type of conservatism, which is really a return to the norm, you know, with you know, post-war fusionism, free market conservatism, as, insofar as it ever really existed, mm -hmm. is quite a recent phenomenon. Yes. I mean, <clears throat> they are very hostile to individualism. Mm. I think they misinterpret individualism. They think of individualism as... Um, the idea, well, they explicitly make say this, that it's the thesis that individuals should face no obstacles in the satisfaction of their desires. That is not what individualism means yes. in the mouth of a classical liberal or somebody like Friedrich Hayek or Milton Friedman. It's not what they mean at all. That's actually closer to the progressive ideas. Nevertheless, they think that's what they claim liberalism is, and uh, individualism is, and they're very hostile to individualism. What they want instead of it, as I said, it's not very clear, but it's, so far as I can kind of guess, it's a return to a, the pre-enlightenment uh, kind of uh, way of life or regime where um, religious authority dominated uh, political and social life. Um, I think, unsurprisingly, almost all of them are devout Christians. So in um, the United States, the leading figures are Catholics. Yeah. In the United Kingdom, they're Church of England. Um, but they all want a kind, the state, to impose a, a particular value system on everybody, and it's a, it's a traditionalist Christian value system. Absolutely. And one of the, the, the aspects of this where they might be right to some extent in, in conflating the sort of progressive or socialistic modern liberalism, as they might call it in America, versus our brand of, of, of individualist classical liberalism, uh, is that we tend to both, though both of those sides agree, that in what you might call social issues, pure matters of personal choice, relationships, you, you know, what you do with your own body, for example, things like same-sex marriage, things like divorce, mm -hmm. uh, the, the rights and status of women in society, we do, to some extent, say that you should be able to behave in any way you so choose, so long as you do not coercively prevent anybody else from doing so. Uh, when they attack that type of value, should, should we really sort of see that for what it seems like it is, which is a, a, an assault on 
on individual expression, assault on free speech and assault on the free conscience. And if that is true, you know, is this not sort of the most sinister threat to liberalism from an ideological perspective that we have seen for quite some time? Um, I, <clears throat> I think it is, but I think it's a, a, little, a little bit more complicated than saying that we on this topic are with the left. We, we are with an element of the left. So I think that um, you and I would agree that people ought to be able to adopt any way of life that they want to, provided they don't coerce others or harm others in the process of doing it. Uh, so, for example, you know, they you say you know, gay marriage, divorce, be transgender if you want, you know, whatever it is that you want to pursue. So in that, now, and a lot of people on the left would say the same. So we agree that far. Yes. But I think where we don't go all the way with them is that many on the left want it to be well, some actually want it to be illegal to criticise sure. those choices, those ways of life. They also want others to bear the cost of those ways of life, insofar as they have any. So, for example, let's say uh, gender reassignment surgery. I mean, I, I not, wouldn't stop anybody from doing it. On the other hand, I wouldn't force anybody to pay for it who Absolutely, didn't want yeah. to. So I think we don't go the whole way with the, the progressive left. We go as far as the individual liberty part, but not the next steps. S sub subsidising the behaviour yeah, and banning criticism. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, we have that in common. Now, on, on the, let's call them the reactionary right, they wouldn't call it that, but they'd say the post-liberal right. Yeah. And they actually share something in common with the left, which is that they think that state power should be used to make people lead the correct way of life, do the right things. Um, now, as it happens, people on the left are quite tolerant and open-minded about personal matters, you might say. However, they do want to force people to do certain... They, they want the economy to be arranged in a certain way, whether people want that or not. Um, they want education to be given in a certain way, whether people want that or not. So there, there's an authoritarian strand on the left as well. And the post-liberals, uh, they're authoritarians both on economic matters and on social matters. And they, so in that sense, they agree with the left that they want the state power to be used to promote their vision of the good life. The difference is simply that they have a different vision of the good life from those on the left. Both think it should be imposed on people and that the state should do that. They, they agree about that. They just disagree about what the good life is. As I've sometimes put it, it's like a dispute between Muslim theocrats and Christian theocrats. Right? So they're, they're agreed we should have theocracy. Yeah. They just disagree about religion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, 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 the timing of the growth of this movement, there has always been, you know, even you know, at the height of Reaganism uh, and Thatcherism, a, a strand of conservatism that's still been that very traditionalist, reactionary, mm -hmm. um, statist type of ideology. But its re-emergence, particularly in intellectual spheres and particularly over in the United States, has been over the last few years. And the, the, the timing strikes me as slightly bizarre. I mean, yes, it's understandable that the left has grown in cultural status, uh, I mean, seized many you know, important institutions and weaponized them against their political opponents. That's certainly true. But should that not tell these people that maybe creating a democratic version of the war of, of all against all in the form of having the state dictate even more areas of our lives and conduct is not a good idea? Because whether you're uh, a you know, member of a minority like the gay community or a member of a, a, a minority community like um, you know, an evangelical Christian, um, the, the best way for you in the long run to thrive is for as few parts of your life to be governed by the, the decisions of other people as possible. It, isn't it a bit strange that they've seen what the left's done and interpreted that as, oh yeah, we just need to do our it, version it's, of that? It's, I agree with you, it's a mistake, but it's not strange. So... Uh, I wrote something, actually, I think it's about to come out for the IEA uh, on these matters, and I mentioned the Office for Students, which the Conservative Party has set up. It's a yes. body that um, regulates uh, universities, to yes. some extent, in the interests of students, in yes. theory. And what the Conservatives are trying to do with this organisation is, among other things, is to stop universities from banning speakers for political grounds and so on. I think that's a mistake along the lines that you are suggesting because do they really believe that having set up the Office for Students, the, ne the incoming Labour government is going to use it for free speech ends? I think they'll, they'll use it for completely different ends. Don't, you shouldn't have that power there. Don't just leave it 
don't establish it. It will get used by the other side in ways you don't want. And, so and do supporters of this policy really believe that this government, as in the one that's done nothing to roll back hate speech restrictions, that's set up buffer zones for protest around abortion clinics, mm -hmm. is going to be the, yeah. the, the entity that upholds free speech at university? I mean, come yeah, on. Yeah, so I agree with you it's a mistake. However, it's an understandable mistake. It, it's the fight fire with fire uh, idea. I've, I've had this, this argument comes up all the time. So when you're opponents are playing dirty tricks on you yeah. of certain kind of like trying to get you cancelled and so on right? it's a great temptation when one of them slips up to try to cancel them and I've seen people on our team so to speak trying to leap in and try to do that and if you go like, whoa whoa we don't believe in that right we don't think they should have gone they go well they do it to us we're going to do it to them and I think that's a very natural reaction um, and so I'm not I don't think that I'm not surprised that they're doing it at this time. And I think the reason is what you said, that there's been such gains on, on the cultural left. And some of it is so crazy that you kind of go, what? I can't have this. And, and you feel, I've got to get, the way I'm going to fight it is by banning it or whatever it is, and rather than just going, well, okay, you're allowed to say all that crazy stuff and I'm going to argue about why you're wrong. So the temptation to just stamp it out in, in the way that they would do to you, yeah. that's a very powerful temptation. And I think the, the fact that we have a reactionary right at the moment isn't surprising at all. There's a lot for them to react to. Sure, yeah. Uh, and and what, what, the, the other thing that's sort of slightly puzzling to me, I suppose that that, that makes sense when you, when you put it in that terms, you know, reactionary movements do, well, that's literally they what react. they do, right? <laughs> it does what it says on the tin. Um, but the, 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 the other thing that sort of, concerns me uh, and puzzles me about this is that while I am certainly not a conservative and I think the the liberal movement as a whole should be less conservative um, I do think there's a conservative case for free markets they do promote certain conservative values mm -hmm. such as prudence um, and, uh, family responsibility um, personal responsibility uh, fr free markets and, and, and interplay between consenting individuals regulates certain um, negative behaviours like fraud or violence, for mm -hmm. example. Um, having seen that when the state is weaponised, not just by the left, but throughout history, it is a very revolutionary, violent, unconservative type of institution. Do you think, then, that this is uh, uh, an ideology, a, a movement that might die within the right, do you think that the case for free markets within the conservative right can and, and, and should be won? Or do you think it's a bit of a lost cause and they are just going to go down this tit for tat, I hate my enemies type route? The current trend is certainly that the free market um, classical liberal faction within the right wing parties, and let's say the Republicans in America and the conservatives here, is, is in retreat and the post liberals are on the rise. And I also agree with you that. Uh, I think it would be a disaster for conservatism because I don't think that what you get actually with uh, uh, when you've got the big state version of conservatism, it doesn't really fit with traditional conservative ideas where you've got organic change in society, um, self-reliance and so on. You get this great big organisation which gets captured and imposes, well, it becomes radical as you said and, and you get something closer to fascism. Um, and you know, conservatives have traditionally been very opposed to that kind of thing. And so I think you're dead right. It's very, very important for conservatism, small c conservatism, that it sticks with the small state kind of a, an approach. Um, I think that it, it's not going to, unfortunately. There's an interesting thing happening uh, now in the, around the Conservative Party, which is they realize that they're going to be wiped out at the next election. The, we may have fewer than 200 Conservative MPs, maybe 150, something like that. It could be a real wipeout. And the, what everybody is interested in, of course, is capturing the rump of the organisation so that when it rebuilds, as it probably will, um, they'll own it. And who's the, so the factions, there's going to be a little factional war in, um, in the Conservative Party. And I think that it's very unfortunate what happened with Liz Truss 
because the for better or worse she was kind of the the face of the small government uh, uh it's unfortunate but there you are face of the small government um faction and it all went wrong right and so i think that's been a real setback for us and it, it means that the and i did note actually on twitter that the post liberals and the conservative party were loving it yeah they absolutely. were reveling in it um so i i yeah, fear the final that nail in the coffin of this of this uh narrative of atomistic hyper-materialistic capitalism they've confected right? yeah this was it this is you know, almost a message from god for some of them I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, and you know so i think they're going to be in the ascendancy for quite a few years um and even if the labor party fails which i'm sure they will in government um the post-liberals can portray that not as a failure of state control and uh, and the kind of thing they'll portray it as a failure of left-wing ideas yes. if we have a right-wing big state government, it'll all be okay. Uh, so I, I fear that ch chances are we're going to get a Starmer government followed by a post-liberal conservative government two or three elections time. I'll be, I'll, I might be dead by then, so I won't, won't matter too much. <laughs> I mean, I really do dread the thought, right? Um, you, you've got more to worry about yeah, than I yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, massively. Um, yeah, not filling, filling me with an immense amount of optimism, to be honest, but I think you might well be right. Um, but. What, what, what should that teach us then as classical liberals? Because, you know, I've uh, spoken to, to people on this show like uh, Aaron Ross Powell over in the States who is very much an advocate of trying to build more bridges with people on the left. You know, there are, there are people who think we should, you know, try and recreate fusionism, the Reaganite Thatcherite mm -hmm. consensus. There are people who think we should do like, lots and lots of different things. No doubt across the Western world, our movement is at a crossroads. I'm not really convinced by any of these explanations, to be honest. But it, even if you think that the path of least resistance is to try and rebuild the alliance, so to speak, between liberals and the right, it's if your narrative of this is correct, and I think it may well be, they have no room for us. And it's an ideology that's not just like we can meet in the middle. It's diametrically, explicitly opposed to core liberal values. And so even if the left's a total non-option, what on earth do we do about this? Well, the live and let live faction um, has kind of disappeared. So that's what I mean. On the, on the left, they're very tolerant about um, individual choices about what you do with your own body and so on. But they're not live and let live people because no. they won't allow disagreement. So that there's no live and let live uh, faction really of any significance. They're not hippies, right? It's very different. No, they're not the hippies. Yeah. And indeed, the hippies, some of the hippies were kind of libertarians. Some of the hippies had our kind of politics, actually. Um, and so I think hippies are gone. Um, we're a small faction now. Um, I had thought this question, what's the strategy for us to promote our ideas, probably came up at, uh, in the Think Tent thing at the Tory Party conference years ago, and there was a panel discussion, and I was on it. And I suggested then that the way to do it was to... to um, to be nasty about politicians. So to, to say any big government system actually is just giving a lot of power to politicians. These are people. The government isn't a magical entity. These are individual people. And it just wage war against those people. So point out how unintelligent they are, how hypocritical they are, how arrogant they are, how this was the idiot I was at school with and he didn't know anything. A wage a war on them, sue them relentlessly, put drag them through the courts for everything that they, because they, they'll they'll break various little regulations, they make their lives a misery, parody them, ridicule them, mock them, and this is a way of getting. And the goal is to make people see that whenever the state wields power over you, it's actual individual people doing it. And who are those people? Are they morally superior? Are they more intelligent? No, they're the people who can manage to get themselves elected and into government. And the people who are good at that are not necessarily the finest people on earth. And I think that's my strategy. It's very negative, of course, but the problem is it's speaking about the glories of, of capitalism and how the price mechanism, and blah, nobody's listening. It's, yeah, I mean, uh, that is very true. The making the, difficult, making the, the positive case is, it seems to me, there's just not really a lot of space for it at the moment. But you know, there is a downside to going negative as well. No, I mean, our ideology is one fundamentally of progress and emancipation and mm. generating wealth. 
But even if you go negative against politicians, and, and you, you don't, you certainly don't have to sell me on this, I'm not a big fan of politicians, and I think m more importantly, the incentives of government are just bad no matter who mm -hmm. you put in there. But it, doesn't that just add more fuel to the whoever the reactionary out of power side is? Where they can just say, oh yeah, I agree with you, these people are the worst, but our guys will be fine. <laughs> Like, yeah. It's fine, you just got to get different guys in. So, the guys who are no, virtuous, no, the guys who are Christian, you know, whatever. So you're right that it's best to explain it partly in terms of their perverse incentives. Yes. Um, yeah. And indeed, Deneen's book, he says one of his answers to, you know, how, what are we going to have, uh, how are we going to get this post-liberal nice regime, is that we're going to have better people. He honestly just says we need better people uh, in the elites. And how are we going to get that, I don't know. But... Another reason I'm sceptical, even of my own strategy, is that something very peculiar about modern politics is that there's general contempt for politicians. I mean, they're held in very low esteem already. Um, and yet and people yet want people more want, government. Want, they that's want more sorry, government, yeah. yeah. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's and it's so perverse. You, you, why do, there's always this funny idea that the next bunch is going to be great. Yeah. You know, and why do they, what on earth could make them think that? Yeah. And it, there have been times throughout history where people, whether it's mass movements or small movements in the elite, have been able to shrink the state and have been driven by a commitment to just wanting the government out of the way. Unfortunately, often those times are just after the government has done something utterly horrific. Is there a way, please tell me there's a way, <laughs> that we can get to the point where we can even just have the argument, never mind convince you, even just have the argument that maybe this is just institutionally is wrong and getting, you know, having these people have less control is a good idea and having you having more control is a good idea. It, can we even get to that point without something really bad happening? The, the economy going into complete meltdown, the country turning into an authoritarian society, completely authoritarian society? Well, I don't... I, there are some people... Uh, on our team, so to speak, who wish for things to go wrong so that people will learn the lesson and opt for our kinds of solutions. But I think that that's a b bad idea for two reasons. One is things going wrong is bad, <laughs> so you don't want things going wrong. I mean, it could involve a war or something, so we yeah. really don't want that. The other problem with the reasoning is that often the reaction to things going wrong is to want a, a real hard man, a, a more authoritarianism. So I, I have no confidence in the idea that if things went wrong, we would get, um, we would get uh, what we want, what you and I want. I think we'd get, we may well get something worse. Um, my, well, one little area of hope I'll give you, maybe, is that <clears throat> as kind of the, the certain bad ideas permeate society and it's a kind of authoritarianism, cultural authoritarianism partly, not done by the government, but, you know, this, cancel culture type stuff, as that stuff permeates society, dissatisfaction with various institutions is growing. Um, the police, the army, schools in particular, universities, they're becoming dysfunctional in the sense that they're not giving people what they really want from them, right? The police aren't stopping crime, universities aren't teaching people anymore properly. You know, some subjects they are, but others are rubbish. Even schools are getting polluted by all this, and you're getting great armies of enforcement officers going around making sure that certain kinds of... Or the, trying to make the whole crazy thing hang together and work. And it, they're becoming a great drag and things are getting worse. The quality of output's getting worse. And there could be an uprising against that. I can see people just going, I'm fed up. You know, we spend so much in tax and we're getting such a bad deal that there could be a kind of a revolt along those lines. Yeah. And that would be an anti-state, an anti-government kind of a revolt. That's my great hope, that something like that will happen. Um, you know, if you think about it, I if you think, what is the biggest problem that most people have in their lives at the moment, apart from their kind of individual personal problems? It's the bloody government. I mean, it is a major problem. It's running a crap health system. The state schools are rubbish compared with what they could be. Um, they tax the bejesus out of us all. And, you know, they're not very good at foreign policy. No. Uh, well, what are they doing well? So it's a biggest single burden in most of our lives is the state. And I, maybe people will come to see that. Mm. And perhaps these nostalgic post-liberals might remember that 
in the golden age of thatched roofs and small town communities, the, the, most, the biggest daily interaction you'd have with the state would probably be the postman. Or the local Bobby, perhaps. Well, it depends if, how... If, you know, if you're the average person. It depends how far we're going back. So if we go back to, let's say, the late 19th century, even up till the 1950s, the state played a relatively small part in your life. And so did the church. I fear that what the post-liberals really want is to go back a bit further. They want to go back maybe to the 17th century. I think, I think that's quite clearly what they want, right? And, and then yeah. I don't think we're any better off because then you've got, maybe it's not the state, but the church is more or less the state. The state yeah. And so I think that's what they really want. They, they sometimes talk nostalgically about the 1950s as a yes. kind of golden era. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nuclear families, uh, you know, man brings home an income for the whole family. High levels of church attendance, yeah. um, very few children born out of wedlock, yes. all that kind of thing. Yeah, lower crime. Yeah, that's, yes. I mean, it's interesting, you know, they, they diagnosed the departure from that over the last 50 years as having been the result of classical liberalism. Mm. I think the departure from that, insofar as it has political causes, I mean, many of the causes are actually technological, like the contraceptive pill, which yeah. had a huge effect on society. But insofar as there are political causes, it's the rise of the welfare state, I think, that has undermined that kind of, um, what you might call the fabric of traditional communities. Because there was a lot of interdependence. Churches administered welfare. Families were the main unit of welfare dispersal. So once you get a... Trade unions, friendly trade societies unions, yeah. as well. Because I mean, it's, uh, one of the interesting things about the post-liberal ideology is that you have at least two very distinct backgrounds, traditional conservatives, but also these sort of communitarian leftists as well, that we call them blue Labourites mm -hmm. in the UK, who are very much fans of the active civil society. I'm thinking of people like Morris Glassman, for mm -hmm. example. The active civil society, the role of the trade union, and, uh, I mean, uh, you, know, you would love to say the state undermines that. Well, it's crowded, not... crowded out is the term you want. Indeed, crowded it's out. It's crowded them out because the state forces you to enrol in a what would have been... A friendly society. You've got to pay tax and the government pays you an unemployment benefit if you get unemployed. In the past, that was done privately through these organisations, including trade unions. I mean, it's interesting that a lot of left-wing politicians have brought about the demise of trade unions because trade unions used to do play that insurance function. They did, they did that for their members. They negotiated term working conditions for their members and wages. Now, the government introduces minimum wage. A lot of the function of the trade union is gone. There's so much regulation of employment conditions Indeed, that, yes. again, what's the trade union supposed to do? Uh, why would you bother being a member of a trade union nowadays? Very little to gain from it. So it's odd that the... I mean, it's not an intended consequence, obviously, but it has... The growth of the state, and in particular the welfare state and the regulatory state, has crowded out these civic society institutions that some on the left and, and the post-liberals yearn for but they don't seem to me to diagnose correctly why they disappeared. It wasn't classical liberalism. It was progressivism. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that, that leads on to the one final thing I want to ask where we might have some hope, is that if this post-liberal movement gains traction, whatever particular country in the West, and, well, I mean, it certainly already has done in places like Hungary, um, mm -hmm. to some extent Poland, I, I suppose, as well. Um, but if the post-liberal movement gains traction in a place like the UK or the US and really leads a very muscularly reactionary and right-wing party to success and does a lot of things with the state power that the left established that they don't like. Do you think that might be one potential avenue where we could speak to people on the left more? Because one of these things that I'm keen to express when I speak to people on the left is it, the, the, the underpinning goal of progress, human emancipation, tolerance, cosmopolitanism, diversity, mm -hmm. we, we mostly share. We obviously mm -hmm. just have a very different way of going about it. And that when you get the state involved, you create a zero-sum game. Someone has to win, someone has to mm -hmm. lose. So far, you got lucky. That ev the stars have aligned institutionally, culturally, that you're winning most of these zero-sum games. But do you think, if the right gets in and starts winning quite a lot of them, that you can make these arguments such as you know, get the zero-sum game out of labour disputes, get the zero-sum game out of welfare, right. get the zero-sum game out of, well, out, of, out, of, out of trans issues, for example, well, I think and start rolling the state back and get some allies on the left to do it. Well, I think absolutely that's right. That would happen, I think. And the most clear place where it would happen would be free speech. 
Uh, you exactly. always want free speech if you're uh, the opposition, because you want to be free to criticize. The, and the establishment doesn't want free speech because they don't want to be criticized, right? Okay. So the, and the left, in the, take the 1960s in America, you know, the, the left were the pro-free speech people because the dominant ethos in America then was a very conservative one. And, you know, students, rebel, students wanted to be able to do and say stuff, and so they were pro-freedom. And the outsiders always pro freedom, and the establishment always. And, and the fact that it's the left who doesn't like free speech nowadays shows you who's on top. Exactly, yeah. Not, it's very conservative in some ways, yeah. isn't it? So I, I, I think you're right that if we got a government that did all that, you, we would again be able to make friends with people on the left. I think you're right. However, I think, and this is in a way positive, uh, I think it would be very difficult for a post liberally motivated government to do the things they want to do, because most of the population is actually very liberal by now in, in the social sense, right? I mean, yeah. you start banning divorce, yeah, closing true. shops on Sundays, all that stuff that they want to, do, you know, they want to do. Um, there'll be up to outrage. I mean, you know, we're we're not having that. No, but it's it's sort of some of them less insane proposals they have you know yeah stuff like doing exactly the same as the, the left have done on free speech in universities for example getting the government involved in that taking a much more hostile so approach owen jones isn't allowed to talk at o university owen so. uh, yeah owen jones gets <laughs> deplatformed by the ombudsman or whatever um uh, taking a much more hostile approach or sorry at least a much more pro nuclear family approach in mm -hmm. terms of you know subs reform. subsidizing them to holy hell and leaving mm -hmm. everybody else in the cold you know that that type of stuff. That's not not. You are right. We're not socially conservative enough. It's not going to be. You have to go to church. We're closing shops on Sundays. It's not going to be that. But those types of things that will still very much anger a lot of people and a lot of people on the left. Mm -hmm. You know that, that that could be viable now. Yeah, and maybe create backlash. Maybe and those policies are the kind that they think they probably would do. Yeah. Um, yes, maybe. All right. Well, on that happy note, Jamie, thank you very much for joining me today. My pleasure. And thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed that episode, please give the video a like. And if you want to see more, please subscribe to the IA London YouTube channel. Thank you very much.